You might be familiar with the parable of Schopenhauer regarding porcupines. Now this Schopenhauer's porcupines is an excellent parable for community living. You know, what Schopenhauer talks about is that when these porcupines, you know, when they are in a group, when they are in a community, they feel cold in the cold season. So they want to huddle together. And what happens when they huddle together? Their body is covered with, their skin is covered with this kind of long, um, sharp, needle-like uh, feathers. So when they come together, they begin to poke each other. They begin to hurt each other. So it's painful to be together. So what do they do? They drift apart. It's better to drift apart. But when they drift apart, they feel cold. They are freezing to death. So they come together for the warmth of everybody. But again, this happens. When they come together, there is better warmth. But what happens is they begin to poke at each other and everybody begins to get hurt. So they move apart. So our community life can be compared to these Schopenhauer's porcupines, you know? We know that being together is beautiful, it is necessary, but when we come together, you know, the thorns that everybody carries, the wounds that everybody carries, begin to, you know, poke each other and we get hurt further. So we drift apart and then we freeze to death. And then we come together, then we hurt one another. So this is a dynamic of community life, but what we will reflect today is how can we um, better our situation? How can we continue to be together without hurting one another? And for that, you know, the, 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 the best place to start is ourselves. It's we who need to change, not the other person. So basically the themes that we will uh, deal with today, we have quite a few uh, areas to cover. We'll reflect on some foundational skills and then will reflect longer on communication because you know conflicts arise mostly because of our failures in communicating compassionately. Do's and don'ts of communication or confrontation. Uh, we won't explain that much. I'll give you the list of do's and don'ts which are very important. You can go through uh, at your spare time. I'll also share a few thoughts about presencing how to act from the future. Presencing is a new paradigm that is actually used by many business houses, now are also being applied to religious life as a, as a new paradigm. Then how can also be learned from various models that the Bible, the scriptures, and our tradition, and your own congregations have placed before us. That is basically the plan for the day. We'll also break in between for a few minutes so that we can you know, stretch our legs, have a cup of coffee and come back. Well, you might have noticed that this course is titled Conflict Transformation, not Conflict Resolution. Now this term conflict resolution is no more in currency. We don't resolve conflict, we transform them as growth moments. You know, somebody said the best conflict resolution that we can have is to eliminate the enemy. So there is no transformation happening. There is violence and death. And very often conflicts are necessary for growth. So let's not resolve it and end it forever. Let us keep transforming them. So looking at conflict from a positive perspective as invitation to growth, that will help us transform that conflict and make them real steps towards future uh, further growth. Therefore, the word that the phrase conflict transformation is more constructive, it is wholesome, it is more positive. And when you say resolution, that actually points, that only talks about the problem at hand. When we talk about transformation, we are actually speaking about primarily the people involved the human persons, and of course, secondarily about the issues, rules, structures, etc. It is we who must get transformed in dealing with conflicts. And finally, when we speak about conflict transformation, we give greater focus on the process 
than the end result. So with this base, let us move on to um, the found, one of the foundational skills. I'll share a couple of them with you. And then later, these foundational skills are also necessary for the advanced skills that we'll be speaking about. The first thing is we must develop a capacity to change the frame of our, pers uh, our perception. This uh, sentence by Einstein is pretty famous, and you know that already, I believe. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. It seems self-evident, but it isn't. Because very often, we, by our lifestyle, create problems in the community, and we try to solve that problem remaining within the same lifestyle, same attitude, same ways of thinking, same perspective, same frame. We can only solve a problem if we can change the level of consciousness wherein we created it, where we can change the frame of perspective and look at the problem from a wider, higher, deeper perspective. So what would that mean? It would mean we should consciously try to understand the perspectives of others. So it's actually extending the frame of my understanding the problem from myself in order to include the perspectives, perspectives, perspectives of everybody that is present. Secondly, to recognize that a problem has many sides and colors, you know, like they say, 50 shades of gray. So can I spend time to look at the problem from all these perspectives, sides and colors that it has? I should also become tolerant and receptive to the views, to the solution, solutions, the opinions, and the arguments of others that can further open up my frame and give it a wider perspective. And that would facilitate new ways of solving the problem. Now, just to explain this, why we need to change the frame to resolve conflicts or to transform conflicts, I'll present to you a very, very popular um, figures that you come across in any basic psychology test textbook. You have seen this already. I'm giving you two pictures. Look at the first one. I'm sure all of you have seen this. Let us look at it again in our context of reflection. Now, the first picture, you may, if you hadn't seen these pictures before, or if somebody hasn't seen these pictures before, you might see just two phases and nothing else. Or somebody might just see a vase a chalice and nothing else. But actually this figure has both. You can see the two phases. You can see the cup or the chalice or the vase. You just have to reverse the frame. You just have to change your perspective. So if you look at those dark areas as the figure and the white areas as the background, you will immediately see the two phases. And if you reverse that figure background dynamics, you know, you look at that white space as the figure and the black space as the background, you will immediately notice the chalice or the cup or the vase. Similarly, in the second picture that you have there, you would see either a young girl or an old lady. Sometimes a person who looks at it for the first time might see only one figure. The person may have lots of difficulties to see the other figure. And to recognize the other figure, to see the old lady besides seeing the young lady, or to see the young lady besides seeing the old lady, we have to change the frame, change the perspective. We have to reverse the dynamics of the figure and the background. And that's what I'm talking about, 
changing the frame. When we have an issue in the community, let's say an intercultural community has issues. And let's say that one of the conflicts is because of people not failing to, people not, you know, people failing to understand the context, the cultural context from which some people come. If you already have a prejudice about certain cultures or tribes or caste or language groups or rights or regions or race, if you are not willing to change the frame and to look at the person from a different perspective, from a different understanding, we will not be able to solve the problem. You can think of cases that you have come across. Another change of perspective we need is from inter to trans, from ego frame to echo frame. Now, what do we mean by inter to trans? See, if I have a problem with Father Robin, it just Father Robin and myself, and we can get stuck between us. A conflict that is inter between him and myself, or it could be within the community, all the members involved. Can I change my frame to trans, meaning to transcend beyond this particular group? We can call it, there is no verb like this, but we can make a verb. Can I do the task of transing, meaning transcending, seeing beyond? a wider horizon. Let me give an example. Let's say a community has an issue regarding a particular ministry. And the community, every member is fighting about this particular ministry. Now, can they sit down together? Can they go beyond from within them to the wider perspective, a transcendent perspective of the wider mission of the province or, or of the congregation? And can they reflect back on their conflict, on their problem from the perspective of the province? What exactly one, the, the, does the province want us to do? What exactly is the mission of the province? What we are fighting about? Does it have any relevance for the mission that the province wants to realize or the congregation wants to realize? So if we can just move beyond trans this and look at the problem from a different frame, maybe we may, be, we may, we may have better solutions for our conflicts. Similarly, ego to echo, and that's what Laudato Si is all about, you know. Don't just look at anything, any problem of the world from my personal egoistic perspective. And it's not just me who has the ego, the community can have an ego. The province can have an ego, a corporate ego. Even a congregation can have an ego, a congregational ego. Sometimes I like saying, you know, anyone who loves his congregation or his culture or his race or his caste or, or his tribe or his tribe or whatever, more than Christ, is in a way committing adultery. Our commitment is to the vision of God, is to the dream of God. And that must be the widest ecology from where we are operating. So can we move from the center that is me or my province or my community? Can I move to the margins? Meaning, can I move to the peripheries? Exactly what Pope Francis is asking us, you know? Because the view from the periphery is always different. It's always different. And further, when you integrate the entire ecology of the universe and also the divine ecology, the Trinitarian ecology that embraces everything that exists, maybe we can solve our problems better. Like in the seminary, when we were seminarians, you know, one of the phrases, I don't know that the students these days speak about it, when there was any issue, somebody would make a comment, you know, compared to eternity, what is it? Compared to eternity, what is it? What is this problem? You know, it's, it was always a, a fun statement, but that was a beautiful transing. 
It was a beautiful transing from ego to echo, the, the divine ecology, the Trinitarian ecology. You know, compared to eternity, some of her problems are nothing. It's like, you know, when we have some very personal issues, if you can do a meditation on our death or go to the cemetery and spend a couple of hours there and then look back to our lives, we will feel like, what are we fighting about? All these fights are so silly. And that is trancing. And it's all about sitting on God's porch or sitting on God's lap and seeing the world from his perspective, the ecology of God. What Kierkegaard says, you know, life is to be lived forward, but understood backwards. The kind of little issues we have that seem so tremendous and intense might appear to be very silly, you know, when we have passed a few years down the line. So it's always good to place ourselves deep into the future and then look at our lives from the perspective of the future, which is what I will talk about when we speak about presencing. Now, this is another issue, another, another problem you might have come across, the nine dot problem. Almost all the basic psychology books would carry this, you know. If someone hasn't done this, you can try it now. I'm sure 90% of you or 99% of you have seen this. This is called the famous nine dot problem. Now, your task is to connect all these dots with straight lines. So there are certain conditions. Once you put your pencil to the paper and start connecting, you cannot lift your pencil from the paper until you finish. Second, you cannot pass over a line that you have already drawn. And you have to use straight lines. And finally, you cannot use more than four lines. So using these conditions, can you connect all these nine doors? Now, a very popular example, I know you know the answer, but this is a, this is a wonderful example for the need to change the frame. The need to get out of the inter to the trans, from the ego, to the echo, to the wider horizon. Anybody is trying? <laughs> well, I'm going to the answer. The answer is very simple. You know, it's a very simple solution that we have. Unless, you know, our, our initial tendency because of the principle of closure, because these dots are all, you know, arranged sequentially, it appears to our mind as a square. So immediate tendency is to look at it as a square. You know, our mind gets stuck in the shape, in the, in the imagination of a square. And we try to connect these by putting lines, yeah, in a square manner. But then we are not able to because we have to, we have to stick to the conditions that have been placed. Now you can only solve this problem. You can only solve this problem if you break that mental frame of a square and look at it as a triangle. Ah, that's some work. That is some work. Because this, we call that in call that mental set in psychology, you know. We have this mental set of seeing this as a square. To break that set and to conceive of it as a triangle. You need to go beyond. You need to go beyond like this. And this is a solution. So you have to start from a point beyond the points. You have to start, you have nine points given. So you can only solve it if you are able to go beyond these nine and conceive of another point or points out there in the horizon, imaginary points, and then start working. So you start from the top, you can start from anywhere, but for example, start from the top, from a point beyond the nine points, come down on the left, then to the right on the base, go beyond that dot, then re-enter the dots from beyond 
you have to you have to start from um, you can start from actually different points yeah but whichever part whichever point you start from you always have to go beyond you will see that in three different points the the person who solves this has gone beyond now think of our various sets we have in our communities we have mental set about our brother we have mental set about seniors in the congregation. We have mental set about women. We have mental set about men. We have mental set about certain caste, certain class, certain tribes, certain language groups, certain rights, certain regions, certain race. And if we, if we try to solve our conflicts remaining within this mental set, Within this nine dot problem, we will never solve. Can we break those sets? Can we go beyond from inter to trans, from ego to echo? Can we change the frame, change, reverse the figure and background? Only if we do that, we can actually solve our problems in community. Um, you might, some of you might be aware that recently the conference of religious in India, the women's section brought out a study, uh, a very interesting study on the gender abuse religious sisters have suffered at the hands of the clergy. Sometimes it happens within the congregation itself, often from the religious and the clergy. Now, why, does, why do those things happen? It's a study I think all of us would actually read so that, you know, there is so much of clericalism happening. Clericalism doesn't mean that it's about priests. It's about exercise of authority or power, using power to exploit somebody else. And we do this because of the mental sets we have about people. This is the way I should treat these people. That's the set we live from. Can we change these sets, break these sets, go beyond, and then we can actually solve many of our problems. You know, we need such studies so that we can look at ourselves, like what the French um, report that has come out, very painful report. Uh, you know, we need to look at ourselves and church should be a, um, should be a leader in that, should be a model in frankly, openly, without defense, looking at ourselves. We are all wounded people. And unless we recognize the problem, we cannot heal the problem. We cannot solve the problem. So, I think it's a good thing that we have such a study so that we can look at our own behavior, see how we deal with issues and change for the better, transform for the better. The next um, skill that we need is, I don't have to speak much about this, the skill to listen. We know this already, but many of us, including myself, we are very poor listeners. Once a religious, a superior, complained to his spiritual director, I don't know what is wrong with Brother John. He doesn't listen to me. And the spiritual director was a very wise guy. So when the superior said, I don't know what is wrong with Brother John, he doesn't listen to me. The spiritual director responded saying, Father, if you want to know what is wrong with Brother John, I think it is you who must listen to him. The United States Department of Labor in 1991 brought out a major um, report. It was a commissioned study it's called SCANS, the Secretary's Commission on Achieving Necessary Skills. It was about deciding what are the basic skills that should be taught in the school, the primary foundational skills. And one of the six foundational skills the commission recommended was listening. Now, let me ask you something. Many of us religious are working in education. In how many of our schools do we give training for listening to our students. We make them listen to our classes, but do we teach them how to listen as one of the foundational skills for them to live? Not just in education, 
in their life is a foundational skill. Hearing, we know, is passive. The ears just pick up the sound vibes, but listening is an, act, is an active process. So I'm going to give you a test right now, just a few questions. You can answer, answer for yourselves right now to you know whether you listen correctly. So here are the questions. Just nine questions, okay? Answer yourself in your mind, in, in your, in, uh, silently within yourselves. You can even write down in your notebook. Question number one, do you lean forward with an open stance towards the speaker when the speaker is actually sharing something? Do you naturally spontaneously lean forward with an open stance? Yes or no? These are all yes or no questions. Do you look and not stare at the speaker as he or she talks? Again, regarding this, cult this gaze, there are cultural differences, of course, because in, in some of the Asian cultures, you don't look at the eyes of someone who is senior. So, but these are just generic questions. Do you look and not staring, I'm not talking about staring, which is violence. Do you give attention to the speaker as the person talks? Do you rephrase what the speaker has said to ensure that you have listened correctly, you have understood correctly? Because you know, what I think is not what I often speak. There's a difference. And what I speak is not what the other person hears. And what the other person hears is not what that person really understands. So there are four risky points of communication. So sometimes it is necessary that we rephrase what one has spoken to make sure that we have understood him correctly. We'll see some examples um, um, soon in the next session. Do you ask pertinent questions, and that's important, relevant questions to help the speaker clarify and help yourself understand better? And do you observe the non-verbal cues from the person to appreciate his or her feeling states? Even when you are attending a mobile phone, you can pick up non-verbal cues. You know, when you talk over the phone, if you smile as you talk, I tell you, the other person gets it your voice becomes pleasant. If you are eating while you are talking, the other person understands. I, you know, when, when someone, some, somebody calls me and I get a sense that the person is eating while talking to me, I do not like to continue. I say, call me after you finish eating. You know, it's like divided attention. It's like you are not important or I am too busy. Well, that's not the time to talk. So. Do you observe the nonverbal cues from the person in order to appreciate his or her feeling states? Are you mindful of your own feeling states as you listen to the speaker? Now, do you tend to formulate your response even as the person is talking? Sometimes we do that. When somebody is talking, we are actually planning our response. And that's wrong, that's bad listening. Do you tend to use too many yes, but statements in responding to the speaker? Meaning you are, if you're using too many yes, but you are invalidating the feelings of the other. Do you glance away or look away or glance at the watch? Or do you do texting on your mobile while the other person is talking? Now, if your answers to the first six questions are yes, the questions in blue, if your answers are yes, well, you are a good listener. If your answers to the remaining three questions that are in red are no, you are a good listener. So the first six, yes, the last three should be no for ideal listening. Well, you have an idea about how well or how badly you listen. Let's get going. The way we should listen, we can call it amen listening. The four components of healthy listening. 
as a foundational skill. First of all, it should be active listening. Listening, look at that figure, that, that picture that is there. The persons are leaning to each other. Their eye contact is maintained. Their stance is open. They are completely engaged. It's an active listening. Secondly, it must be a mindful listening. Are you aware of the feelings that person is going through? The person may be talking certain things and there are feelings behind those words. Are you able to pick up? Let's say that person is sharing something happy, but the person is tearing up, meaning there is some sort of a mismatch between what the person is saying and what the person is actually feeling. Are you able to pick up? Are you able to pick up your own feelings? Are you mindful of the reactions that you have? Sometimes you feel irritated. Sometimes you feel very, very sad or happy. What are your feelings? And those feelings communicate something. Don't deny those feelings, but understand those feelings what they communicate to you. Empathic listening is the capacity to put yourself in the shoes of the other and experience what exactly the person is experiencing and being able to respond to. I remember a beautiful scene from the movie, Baby's Day Out, I'm sure many religious have watched it, Baby's Day Out. If you remember um, this particular scene wherein the police officer comes to the mother who lost the baby and the police officer says, ma'am, I understand your pain. And the lady asks, sir, have you ever lost a child? And he says, no. And the lady says, and then sir, you do not understand my feeling. And the police officer will say, I'm sorry. And that is true, you know. Sometimes we just throw around these words like, oh, I understand what you go through. No, we don't, we don't really understand what the other person goes through unless we have had an extremely similar experience sometimes. So sometimes empathic listening means not necessarily saying some words that are meaningless hollow, but offering your complete presence. I'm reminded of you know, a, a, a true incident that I read once, you know, one of my textbooks, there was, a, there was a patient, a psychiatric patient in a hospital who never interacted with anybody. There was no progress in his treatment. He completely shut himself down. Now, no staff member liked to be around this guy because he wouldn't communicate, he wouldn't respond, except one staff member. And this staff member, Every day when he finished his work, he would pull up a chair, sit next to this guy, saying nothing. This patient will not say anything. This staff will not say anything. But he would just sit there for nearly 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And at the end, he would say, good night, see you tomorrow. And he would go. The patient wouldn't respond. But the staff member did it day after day, week after week, spending 30 to 45 minutes after work, pulling up a chair, being seated next to the patient, saying nothing, just being present. And at the end saying good night and not receiving a reply. After a couple of months, one day when he said good night, the patient for the first time said, good night. And that was the beginning of the patient opening up slowly to this particular staff member. And that was the beginning of the patient's recovery. You know, how, how um, impatient are we to have others changed? Sometimes what we need is just being able to give our presence. Finally, naked listening. Naked listening means stripping ourselves of all our prejudgments, 
our biases without any judgment. You know how Pope Francis became the, the, the person of the year for Gays and Lesbians Association in one particular year. That was the year Pope Francis made that very famous statement, who am I to judge? Now we know very clearly, Pope Francis hasn't changed any of the church's teachings on sexuality. But his response was so pastoral that the world was taken by surprise. Who am I to judge? And that's an example of, you know, offering our naked listening or understanding. He wasn't being... Wow. The time flies, huh? Let me move on. Finally, the culture of discernment. Well, um, I will not speak much about this because, um, you know, you definitely, we need to definitely do a full fledged course on discernment. What is needed is, you know, not simply attending a discernment retreat occasionally, once in a lifetime doing an Ignatian retreat. We must make Okay, we need to make uh, discernment as a, a regular attitude, a daily attitude, a habit of our hearts, you know. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. That's what the scriptures tell us. So facing life, seeking God's will, making decisions from him. Make this an attitude towards oneself, others, the life and the world. So basic conditions for developing a culture of discernment would be having a deeper self-knowledge. Um, listening, developing listening skill, integrating the, you know, the various perspectives, the various um, insights that come our way. And finally, having a holy indifference. Holy indifference means, you know, uh, regarding the choices. For example, there are two options given to me as an example. I can go for studies or I can go to a very far off mission area. If this discernment process is going on, I need to have a holy indifference. I do not prefer, I shouldn't prefer one over the other, but just keep a holy indifference what Ignatius talks about so that God's will can be discerned properly. Someone just uh, texted me saying that I could explain naked listening. By naked listening, it's pretty simple. What I'm saying is that listen to the other without judgment. See, when we listen to sometimes our community members, uh, because of the baggage we carry, you know, we already have certain prejudgments, yeah, in our mind. Ah, this person is like that. She is always like that, you know. We have this kind of... Uh, automatic thoughts that are controlling us. So naked listening would mean bracketing this kind of thoughts, dropping this kind of prejudgments, you know, prejudices we have, and try to give whole attention to the person without any, judge, any initial judgment. We may have to make a judgment call at the end of everything, but then while you listen to the person, you give the person the complete attention without any kind of, you know, screening, at the back of your mind. I hope that's clear. Let's move on. Ignatius of Loyola speaks about 14 plus eight rules of discernment, 14 rules for the first week of the retreat and eight rules for the second week of the retreat. I strongly recommend that if someone hasn't read through this, this book, this book is available for download freely. Please read through these rules of discernment that would help you create a culture of discernment that will help you uh, in resolving our conflicts. Well, great. Let me just move on to one of the major skills that we need to develop, building upon these foundational skills, and that is compassionate communication. I will introduce this and maybe then we can take a break. First of all, we can speak about 
two types of communication, nonverbal communication and verbal communication, you know. Uh, nonverbal communication is the way we talk to people without saying a word, with our gestures, with our actions, with our, you know, the tone of the voice, with uh, facial expressions, with our posture. All these things communicate something to people. In fact, in fact, our verbal communication, as per research, is only 7% of our communication. We think we speak a lot. Well, we do speak a lot, but that's only seven. The rest of the communication is all about non-verbal. 38% is specifically about the tone of voice. Your tone communicates something. When you answer the phone or when you respond to somebody, even if you are not visible, your tone carries a message. And that's why it's very important that you should be smiling when you speak over the phone. Your voice becomes pleasant. And that puts the other person at ease. 55% of what is not verbal is actually your gestures, purely non-verbal. Yeah. Your body posture, your stance, your facial expressions, yeah, your gestures, all those things. Your, your, your gaze at the person or where exactly you're gazing, all those are non-verbal. So it's very important that we give, we take care of our non-verbal communication, but I'm not going to speak about that. These are some of the various non-verbal communications. On the extreme left top, the lady is talking something, but both the other guys are on their phones. Well, you will see this these days, uh, even in religious communities, and everybody comes for lunch or dinner, and everybody is on their phones, mobile phones. Yeah, Happens even in restaurants. Families go out for dinner together, but husband, wife, both the children, they're all on their mobiles, eating together. But what, what intimacy happens there? Nothing. Somebody is looking at their nails. Some, in some photos, somebody is dreaming, they're dreaming. Whereas a couple of other photos, three photos you can find, people are giving complete attention to the other person with their facial expression, their posture, the angle with which they have oriented their body always express you know, how, they, how well they are receiving the communication. Compassionate communication is one of the major skills that we need in order to resolve our conflicts. And I'm essentially sharing insights from Marshall Rosenberg from his, uh, this is a book as well as the workshop that he gives, Nonviolent Communication and Language of Life. Now, uh, this man with his um, methodology of dealing with uh, or teaching nonviolent communication has actually been uh, instrumental in resolving conflicts, not only between small groups, but between nations as well. Nations, various tribes, various ethnic, many ethnic conflicts, etc. He has been extremely successful in realizing um, the conflict transformation. Now, I would prefer to call this compassionate communication because when you say non-violent, the word violent is still there. Let's put it more positively. Now, just as a background, some of the blockages to effective communication that we have are these. And these do not need much uh, explanation. We all have experienced this. We have also done this in our community living. Moral judgments they come very easily for us priests and nuns and religious, judging others morally with a moral knife, making comparisons between people. Yeah, he is like this, why can't you be like that? Well, you just cannot compare people, people are different. Then denial of responsibility, I didn't do it, or she made me do it. Communication of wishes as requirements or as demands. Yeah. <clears throat> what I wish is just a wish. It's not even a need. There's a difference between a need and a wish. I need a mobile phone. But getting an apple is a wish, not a need. So very often we sometimes communicate wishes as our necessary requirements, our needs. Then revenge-seeking communication. Communication that seeks to get revenge done on others. 
submerged communication. What do you mean by submerged communication? Communication, certain parts of which are actually sung, which are actually not visible, which are actually underwater. For example, when somebody says, I want you to respect me, what does that mean? That aspect of respect, what exactly you mean by respect is actually submerged. The one who listens to you has no idea what you mean by respect. Then there is so much of noise that we have. By noise, it can be external noise, like a train passing, you're on the mobile and a train passes by or a bus passes by, or there's a huge, if there's a rain happening, there's a huge wind, these are all external noise. But internal noise is the noise in our mind. As I'm talking or as I'm listening, I'm thinking of something else, I'm recalling something else, or all the bias that we spoke about, the judgments that I have, these are all internal noise that I have. So all these actually block effective communication. Now, what are the fundamentals of compassionate communication? Basically three, it's compassion, it's respect for the other person. Every person is a mystery and we respect the mystery that a person is. The person might be doing so many bad things. The person may have, let's say many character defects or whatever, but still he or she is made in the image and likeness of God. If that is true, if he or she carries the Imago Dei in him or her, he or she deserves our respect, fundamental respect and love. We don't need to explain this, you know them already. Now, this is the non-violent communication model that Rosenberg has proposed. Again, I would like to call it a compassionate uh, communication model. Now, this is extremely simple. It's extremely simple, but it needs a lot of habitual practice to make it part of our daily style of communication. The first thing we need to do is when you communicate, you express yourselves clearly and sincerely. And when you express yourself sincerely, it should have four, fa four factors. You should express what you observe. You should express what you feel. You should express what your needs are. And you should express what you are requesting. That's all. And when you listen to somebody or when you receive communication from others, do so with empathy, clarifying the observations other person is making, trying to understand the person's feelings, to recognize the needs that person has, which are actually creating these feelings. And what exactly is the other person requesting? If we can take care of these elements in our communication, active communication and active reception of communication by the other, you know, 90% of our conflicts can be changed, transformed into moments of growth for everyone involved. Now, let us um, go through each component of this and you will find how, how simple it is but how difficult it is to practice actually. Let's see the first one. I'm going to focus on expressing sincerely because once we get that, the second part, listening and receiving with empathy is very easy to understand. So this is essentially the commu compassionate communication, communication process. When, we, when I communicate to somebody, I simply must express the concrete, acts that I'm observing in the other that are affecting my well-being or our well-being as a community. Then I also would say how I feel about what I'm observing. How I feel about what I'm observing. Now, I have a particular feeling precisely because what the person is doing or what I'm observing that the other person is doing 
is affecting some of my needs or values or desires. And so I must specifically request what exactly I want the other to do to enrich my life. That's it. Four components. If you can get them clear, the other person will totally understand what we are communicating. The person will not feel threatened and the person will be able to respond to us and we will be able to have a dialogue. Now, these are more theoretical, but let's come to the practice. We'll, we'll use examples. We go by one by one. The first is observation. So when, I, when we speak in the community, let us not take anybody or anything for granted. So in, in, I'm, just, I'm just sharing with my, with my community member what I'm observing. But our tendency is always to present it as an evaluation. Very often, we do not communicate what we are observing. We communicate our judgment about it. Never mix observation with evaluation. You just have to carefully observe what is happening without evaluating. Specify the behaviors and conditions that are affecting you. Communicate your observation clearly. Avoid using words such as always, never, every time, etc. Because these words are very dangerous. They are absolutizing words. For example, somebody says, you're always late in the chapel. Is that true? It is not true. 99.9% .9 of times it is not true because nobody can be always late for the mass, for the chapel. Maybe at least once the person might have been punctual or even early. So saying always is highly condemnatory, highly judgmental. You never listen to me or you never speak the truth. Every time she's like this, you know, these are how some of our phrases, extremely judgmental. And that hurts the other, and the communication is cut off there, and the conflict remains forever. So mixing observation with evaluation provokes defensiveness, shame in the other, anger, and resistance. There is no dialogue possible. So you have, you can think of your own examples of this kind of communication community life. What we are going to do now is, I'm going to give you a few examples of some of our communications in just single lines. You can respond uh, by yourself. You can mark in your book whether what I'm saying is an observation or an evaluative sentence. So this is it. After reading each one, I will pause for a moment. You can have your response. What you have to decide is, is this an observation or an evaluation? Meaning, the one who is speaking this sentence, is he or she making an observation or is he or she making an evaluation? First one, why do you always make me angry? The one who says that, is he making an evaluation or an observation? You don't have to answer me, just answer to yourself. And I'll give you my answer. It's an evaluation. Why do you always make me angry? You are giving a judgment. You are saying that you make me angry. First of all, this is absolutely wrong. Nobody can make you angry. Nobody can make you angry. Because the anger comes from you, something that is within you. Just an example. You plan a picnic. And you're excited about the picnic. And then on the day of the picnic, it rains. Now, who feels angry? You or the rain? The rain doesn't cause anger. 
the anger comes from you well you will say well am i not angry because it is raining yeah maybe but somebody else in your place might be very happy because she wants to sleep the whole day now it is raining and there is no picnic she can sleep somebody else may be pretty consoled because she was nervous about going out on a picnic now that there is no picnic she is comforted i don't have to you know social anxiety is there i don't want to be with people so what happens is the same event provokes different reactions in the people so where do the reactions come from the reactions come from me come from each person it's like you know one of you calls me a bad word yeah i might laugh or you call somebody else the same bad word he might get angry or you call the third person the same bad word and he might say hey something wrong with your eyes yeah i am not the one who you are talking about so different reactions and this is something we must get very very clear feelings come from within us the others become an instrument in eliciting this kind of feelings so much so i become aware of what kind of feelings i have so the anger comes from me the other doesn't make me angry so this is actually an an evaluation not an observation the second one i have never seen a lazy guy in my life the people from that state or tribe or caste or language are just like that it's an evaluation third you're always late for mass evaluation number 4 i see you checking your mobile phones while i am talking it's an observation because this is a statement of what you are observing you are not judging you are not drawing any conclusion you are not saying you are not gi- giving me attention or you are disrespecting me so nothing you are just saying that while i am talking i see that you are checking your mobile phone so you are giving a chance to the other person to give an explanation the other person doesn't have to be defensive doesn't have to take offense you are just stating the fact next one mark i have noticed that over the last two weeks you have come to prayers late three times imagine that this is a formator saying this is a very specific observation the formator is not saying you are always late for mass you never come on time no no such words the the formator is giving a very specific observation i have noticed that over the last two weeks you have come to prayers late three times very specific an observation now mark can now respond why he was late if he has some reasons a dialogue can actually begin another one i have not received a reply from you for my last two emails an observation not an evaluation let us say that the provincial has sent a letter a mail and you haven't responded or the provincial says i have come on i have not received any reply from you for my last two emails he doesn't say i have never received a reply from you or he doesn't say you haven't replied to me you know if the if the person says you haven't replied to me that's a dangerous statement you know why maybe the person has replied but the reply went to the spam folder so you cannot make a judgment that the person has not replied to you you can only say i have not received your reply meaning it has not come to my inbox i don't know whether you wrote whether you sent but on my end i have not received for the last two emails very specific finally last week when i came to the meeting late he asked me what's the matter can you not afford an alarm clock what do you think observation or an evaluation it's an observation it's a complicated sentence so i am actually here i am reporting something somebody told me 
I came late for the meeting and somebody told me, what's the matter? Can you not afford an alarm clock? See that question, what's the matter? Can you not afford an alarm clock is a judgment. is evaluative, but how am I reporting this? I'm not reporting, I'm now reporting to somebody else, a third person without judgment, without disrespecting, without belittling the person who spoke to me like this. I'm just stating the fact. Last week, when I came to the meeting late, he asked me, what's the matter? Can you not afford an alarm clock? I'm not saying when I came to the meeting last week, he abused me like anything. No, that would be an evaluation. So I hope these examples make it clear for you how we often tend to make evaluative judgments, evaluative statements, judgmental statements, and why we should make observational statements. Because observational statements are about you, what you observe, without judging the other, without identifying the person's motive, and you leave it open-ended so that the other person can actually respond to your observation. Now, what is the next component? That is feeling. What you observe creates some feeling in you. And it's always good to express that feeling. But differentiate feelings from thoughts, okay? We have a tendency to express thoughts as feelings. Thoughts are not feelings, especially men have this problem. Men generally, generally have difficulty accessing and naming the feelings. So we often share our thoughts as our feelings. We'll see some examples. So identify and express your inner states of mind in a way that does not imply judgment, criticism, blame, or punishment. Because you're talking about your feelings. You're not saying that the other person creates that feelings. You observe something in the behavior of the other and you feel in a certain way. Simply express how you feel about what you observe. Let's see the examples. I'm not angry at what you did. Is that an expression of feeling? No, because the person is not actually saying how he feels. The person is actually saying, I'm not angry. Then what are you? It's not enough to say that you are not angry. You have to specify how exactly you feel, whether you are happy, sad, upset, overjoyed, whatever. So that first statement is not a proper positive expression of feeling. Second one, I feel worried when I see that you have not responded to my last five emails. A clear expression of feeling. You're not blaming the other. So connected to the example that we did the last, uh, when we spoke about observation, the provincial says, I have not received your response for my last two emails. And I feel worried about why I haven't received, if anything is happening with you. The focus is on my concern, my worry about not receiving. So that second sentence is a proper statement of feeling. The third, I feel you don't respect me. Wrong. First of all, it's not a feeling, it's a thought. That you don't respect me is a thought, not a feeling. The feeling would be, I'm, I'm unhappy, I'm sad, or I'm angry. And that is here. So first of all, this is a judgment. And it's also a thought, not an expression of feeling. Number four, I feel like throwing you out of my community. First of all, it's not a feeling. It's a thought. And secondly, it is very violent. It's highly judgmental. Number five, I feel upset and sad when I see that you, you have come late for mass five times last week. Clear statement of feeling. Observation followed by statement of feeling. I feel upset and sad as a formator. Six, I don't know how I feel. Pretty disappointing. 
Yeah, there is no idea about the feeling. Yeah, it's not an expression of feeling. Finally, seventh one, I feel disappointed because you have not submitted your report yet. Let's say the economic report. I feel disappointed because you have not submitted your report yet. Well, that you have not submitted is a fact. And I feel disappointed about it. That's my feeling. So to sum up, we observe, we, we state what we observe without judgment. And we express how we feel about it. And then what do you do? We feel about something in a particular way because it's linked with our needs or our values. I feel happy, contented, overjoyed when some of my needs are met, when some of my values are respected. I feel hurt, angry, and upset when some of my needs are not met, when my values are threatened. Specify that. Let the other person know why you feel that way. And that's it. And express the need in concrete terms, very specifically. Examples. I feel angry when you are not obedient. Is it a clear expression of a need or a value? No. You are not stating a value there. You are just saying that you feel angry because you are not obedient. It's a judgment, actually. We don't know whether it is disobedient. It's a disobedience. Yeah, it's a judgment. It's not an observation. It's not a proper expression of feeling. And it is, there is no value or need mentioned there. Second one, I feel great because you are such wonderful students. Yeah, you are a teacher and you tell the students, I feel great because you're you are such wonderful students. Is it an expression of a need or a value? Absolutely no. Because what do you mean by wonderful students? What make them wonderful? They have no idea. Is it because they are dressing well? Is it because they have combed their hair? Or is it because they won a championship? Or is it because they have performed well in class? Or whether they are silent in class? Nothing is clear. You are not specifying what exactly is the value that the students have upheld, which makes you happy. These are all highly generic, very, very unclear statements. Nice statement. Students will might be happy to hear that, but then it doesn't contribute to a constructive communication. And had it been negative, it can hurt many people. Number three, I am glad you informed me the reason for your absence for prayers because I would like to know why someone is absent in chapel. Very clear statement of a need. As a formator, I would like to know it's my need why someone is absent in chapel. Or you can say, because for me, being regular for prayers is an important value. And when I see that you haven't come for prayer five times in the last two weeks, that, that affects me, that concerns me, that worries me. And here, I have put it positively. I'm glad you informed me the reason why you are absent. Because for me, it's important to know why someone is absent, whether the person is sick, whatever it is. So you're stating your feeling. You are stating what exactly you have observed. I observed that you inform me. You are absent and you inform me. And that makes me happy. And why that makes me happy is because for me, it's important that I'm informed about this. It's a correct expression. Number four, I am angry that I did not get a call from you today because it is important for me that I hear from you when you're traveling away from the community. Yeah, as your community member, when you travel away for vacation or whatever, it's important for me to know whether you have reached the place or not. So when I didn't get a call from you today, I was angry. You know, the person doesn't get threatened when we speak like this. You would say, ah, Paulson, these are too many words. Well, there are occasions when we may have to use too many words. 
there are actually not too many. That, that's the clear communication. Ah, oh, it sounds, you know, very artificial. It is artificial, of course, until, until we make it a habit. So initially, you may have to practice it forcefully. But down the lane, in a few months, it will become your habitual way of communicating. And that can solve so many conflicts. Number five, why don't you leave me alone? Oh my God, that doesn't communicate anything. That can only escalate the problem. You are not specifying what you feel. You are not specifying what exactly is the need or the value that is being threatened there, nothing. Number six, I am glad that you scored well, well in the exam. For me, doing well in studies is important to be an effective religious. Well, it's very clear. You did well in the exams. That makes me happy because for me, the religious should do very well in their studies. Seven, I am depressed with what I have accomplished this year because I interpret myself as inadequate for not having done more. It's a clear expression because I interpreted myself as inadequate for not having done more. For me, it's a value that I should do more. I haven't accomplished much this year and that makes me feel depressed, that's sad. Several words, but it communicates clearly your state of mind, your value, your observation about yourself, actually. That makes us to the, brings us to the last component, that is request. So if this is what I observe, and this is what it makes, how it makes me feel, because of this particular reason, now this is what I want you to do. And that's the request I'm making to the other. Ask for what you would like in a way that clearly and specifically expresses what you want, rather than what you don't want. Now make sure that it's really a request and not a demand. You have asked for, you ask for concrete, doable, positive actions, and that's important. So you observe something, you express how you feel about it, you said how, why you feel about it that way, because a need or a value is challenged or threatened or fulfilled. And finally, based on these, now you make your request and you request for very concrete action so that the other person knows what he or she has to do. Example number one, please understand me. Is it clear statement, a clear request? Absolutely no. What do you mean by understand you? How do you want me to understand you? Nothing is clear in that. This happens between couples, you know. You don't love me, please love me. My goodness, the husband or the wife may have no idea at all what the other party means by loving. Let's say the wife says, you don't love me, love me more. And the husband says, don't do I do shopping? Don't I buy things for you? But for wife, that might not be love. So it's very necessary that the partner, it can happen to you know husband, wife, wife, husband. They specify what exactly they mean by loving in concrete actions. For example, I would like that we go out for dinner just two of us, once a week at least. Or we go for a movie together. Or we spend time together talking to each other about the day's events. And these are expressions of loving me. Ah, then the partner knows how to love the person. How many marriages are broken because these terms are not clear? Number two, why don't you say something? Do you have a stone in your mouth? You don't need to comment about that. It's a terrible statement, what we make like that. Third one, I want you to respect me. What do you mean by respect? The teacher says, you are a teacher in a school and you says, I want your students to respect me. What do you mean? What do you mean by respect? Stand up when you enter the class or greet you in the corridor or submit the assignments on time. The students have absolutely no idea. You have to specify what is the exact type of behavior or the act that you expect from them? 
Number four, and this is a good example, okay? The first three are all wrong examples. Number four, before you leave the house, I want you to make sure you check the bulletin board for any important information posted. Let's say this, a case. The person missed the community meeting. So I tell the, I tell the person, you know, I see that you were absent in the last community meeting. And I was a bit sad about it because it's, for me, it's very important that every member is present for our meetings. And the person says that, you know, um, I didn't know it. And you say, therefore, you know, next time, every time you leave the house where you go somewhere, please, I want you to make sure you check the bulletin board for any important information posted so that you don't miss the information needed. Very clear statement of what exactly you want the other to do. Number five, I would like to hear from you more at meetings. Again, community meetings or a staff meeting. I would like to hear from you more at meetings. Is that a clear request? Absolutely no, because what do you mean by hear from you more? The person can make a, you know, he can just shout or scream so that you hear from him more. Be specific, be specific as to what exactly you want the other person to do. You can say that I would like you to share your opinions about the concrete items on the agenda when we take up each agenda each item for discussion and that is fine that's much clearer six i would like you to meet with your personal reflections i would like you to meet me with your personal reflections once a week very specific seven as a community i would like that we go somewhere outside for our monthly reflection and end the day with a dinner out very specific clear expression of what you are requesting the other to do. So what happens is we are putting all this together, you know? So expressing honestly and compassionately would mean stating what you observe, not judgment. Stating how you feel about what you have observed. Stating the needs behind those feelings, needs or values behind those feelings. And finally, making a request for concrete, doable, specific action. If we can do this, our communication will be very healthy and compassionate. Here's an example for putting all these together. Observation plus feeling plus need or value plus R request. Let us look at two examples. <coughs> Sister, I see that you were late for the morning prayers three times in the last one week. I feel concerned about what is happening because as your formator, punctuality at prayers is very, is very important for me. Therefore, would you like to tell me if something is troubling you or if there is nothing, can you please try to come a few minutes early to chapel from tomorrow? You have observation, feelings, value stated and a concrete action requested. Second example, Father, at the community meeting today, when I shared a suggestion, I saw that you laughed. Statement of fact, I felt angry and sad because I understood it as a rejection of my proposal. Your expression your, of your feelings. For me, it's important that you respect and listen to my views even if you may not agree with it, the value is stated. Hence, next time I share something, I would appreciate if you permit me to complete and listen to me attentively. So allow me to complete when I share something. Also listen to me attentively to what I'm sharing. That's the way I would know that you respect and listen to my views. Very clear communication. Well, summary again, the concrete actions that you observe and that affect your behavior. How you feel about what you observe, the needs, values, desires, et cetera, that create your feeling, the concrete actions you request to enrich your life. This is not only for the daily communication, you know, 
if we do this, that prevents our conflicts, or rather that prevents conflicts becoming moments of danger and pain instead of becoming you know, uh, growth moments. And the same style of communication when we are in conflict, when you are negotiating, when you are in a community meeting, dealing with the conflict, you know, it helps us to dialogue better without anybody feeling threatened. It also invites people to dialogue with their perspectives. Everybody shares their perspectives without feeling threatened or without feeling, feeling judged. The other side of this communication is empathic listening, receiving the communication. Now, this, you already know how to communicate. Now, the thing is, you are aware of how to communicate clearly, but the other person may not. The other member in your community might not have taken this course or read the book of um, Rosenberg. So how to receive communication from others with empathy, very briefly. The same thing. The person might be speaking with judgment. So what do you do? You ask the person to specify what he or she has observed in you. The specific, can you tell me what exactly of my behavior is troubling you? Ask the person. And if the person is not expressing his feelings, just making condemnatory statements, help the person to identify and express the feelings that he or she is experiencing, or at least try to understand, read behind the person's uh, words, what exactly could be his feeling. Third, recognize the needs and values of the other person that are harmed or, sat or satisfied by your action. And if you're not able to recognize these needs or values, ask the person to clarify. I see that you are pretty upset with my absence in the meeting yesterday. Could you tell me why that makes you upset? upset? Is it upsetting any of your needs or values? Can you specify them? So you help the person clarify these things for you. And finally, respectfully ask the other person to specify what action they expect from you. So basically what you do is, you have been practicing this model of communicating. Now you help the other person to clarify these things for you so that you can respond better. I'll give you some examples. Just a brief examples, okay? All the four components do not come there. Person A says, in my opinion, Redmi is the best mobile. And the B says, that's ridiculous. Redmi is horrible. That's a wrong way of communication. Judgmental, dismissive of the other. Look at the second example. Sister, you are very partial. You don't care for all equally. How dare you say that? I report you to the provincial. The communication ends there in another conflict. So those two examples are very wrong. Let us look at the third example. You don't love me. I want you to love me. So you, having learned the method of communication, compassionate communication, you can respond. I'm sorry you feel that way, but can you help me understand what you would like me to do to make you feel that you are loved? You're asking for specific action. Next example. Well, I think you're wasting your time. So you help the person to clarify. Do you mean to say that you would like me to spend more time studying is that what you mean? Help the other person to clarify better. Next example, I can't imagine what sort of a principle you will make. Well, you are appointed a principal and somebody else couldn't swallow that decision. So he or she makes such a negative remark, but you can communicate compassionately asking, do you mean to say that you have some specific concerns or worries about my new appointment? Let's talk about it. So without taking offense, you help the person to communicate better. Well, um, we need to, we have another 15 minutes to go. This is a summary of everything. The first part we saw already. Second part is listening empathically to what they observe, to how they feel, to what needs or values are they behind their feelings. And we clarify concrete action requested. Now, like I said, this looks extremely simple. And when you start practicing, it can definitely feel a bit artificial initially, but any skill we practice, when we start the practice, they appear very artificial, whether it is riding a bicycle, driving a car, 
or leading to preach a homily everything feels forced it's natural but if we can constantly remind ourselves and practice this kind of compassionate communication i tell you our community lives would definitely get better and when the conflicts arise we can dialogue better listen to one another better and convert them into growth moments ted dunn and his wife mr and mrs dunn are two individuals two couples i mean couples and uh, two psychologists who have been working with religious congregations for the last 30 years last year ted dunn published a book a very interesting book about you know accompanying religious congregations in their in their life you know for the chapters the assemblies the community issues the conflicts etc he gives a list of do's and don'ts that we should be careful about when confronting one another in the community i am not going to read through this this powerpoint will be sent to you so these are all self explanatory so since we are we have lack of time i am not going to go through them but you will have these uh, files with you i found them you know this guy is has has such a tremendous experience in dealing with religious um, orders and individuals and their conflicts and these suggestions come from his rich experience his and the, the rich experience he and his wife have speak face to face slow down take your time build bridges not walls partner with them and then don'ts avoid emails or phone calls so when you are in a conflict we have a tendency to send mails to them you know you don't want to talk we send emails yeah or text messages it's always good to sp- speak face to face yeah that's how we should be communicating now don't rush to a quick apology from your part don't apologize immediately without explaining anything or don't ask or demand an apology immediately slow down take your time is is important that we understand why the other behaved the way they the, the other did so uh i will just um, skim through this you have the slides anyway yeah with you fine before we end i would like to very briefly introduce this new con- concept that's actually becoming pretty um, significant for the congregations as well the the one professor from massachusetts institute of technology the united states otto sharma is the main brain behind he and his team actually for developing this what is called theory u and basically what they say is this and this is based on his uh, long term study of successful individuals successful leaders you know uh, entrepreneurs so based on that he has developed this theory and several congregations have begun adopting this because it suits very well with our way of life i'll explain in the next slide i just want to introduce this theory i'm not going to explain much but you can explore on the internet and read more about this in fact in our recent general chapter that we clerics had we used some insights from theory u in the process that we adopted for the chapter now what he says is this you you can see a u there yeah what he says is that very often what we do is we look at the past we evaluate the past we identify the problems and we try to find out solutions or we learn from the past of course we learn from the past and he says that's not enough the successful effective leaders and individuals what they do is they learn from the future and that's what we should do so just to explain this the basic graph of the ases on the left side you know our t- left side top our tendency is to always download meaning when i have my community member before me i am already downloading all the stereotypes bias all the judgments preconception that i have about him or her and i am observing from that perspective i am sensing from that perspective we already saw that set you know all those things foundational skills we spoke about come here 
So all this, uh, our observer, we observe the same. We don't, we have a negative attitude towards our community member because we are always operating from the past experiences we have had, the past judgments we have had, the past wounds we have had, always downloading from there. What he says is that we must change that. What we need to do is stop downloading, suspend. You can see the word suspend there. Suspend what your experience that you already had and observe with an open mind. Observe the person with an open mind, meaning observe without, observe nakedly. That naked listening that we said, we can apply here as naked observing. And once you observe with an open mind, you sense with an open heart, yeah? You feel the person with an open heart, any reality or any person or a conflict or anything. It could be a person, it could be an event, it could be a, a problem, it could be anything. So you observe with open mind, removing your old judgments with a fresh eyesight, yeah? You try to feel it with your open heart and you let go let go of all the past experiences so that you can present yourselves. He calls it presencing. Presencing means being present and also sensing. You present yourself at the depth of your being to the future that is presenting itself. Now, that's important. The future is always visiting us, you know, and that's where the Christian theology will go very well with this. So you look at, let, let me take the example of a, a human being, your community member. You look at the person in his potential. Let me go to the next slide that will make it very clear. Yeah. You look at the person because like, as I said, every person is created in the image and likeness of God. And the person has a certain potential. And of course, God sees us from the perspective of who we can be. God knows our potential. So have the vision of God. Look at the person from what he is capable of and be present to that potential of the person. And that potential is always good. And let that future come to you. Let that personality unfold. You always give a welcoming stance. So you crystallize the vision, you crystallize the image and the potential of the person. And you relate to that person, that kind of a person that he or she can be. And therefore you will enact, you will enact you know, whatever solutions or whatever behavior that you want to do relating to him from not what he's actually behaving now with all the negative things or whatever, but what he's capable of behaving, what he's capable of becoming. So in the process, you prototype a different future, yeah? And you perform from that level. Now, this is a brief introduction. What I would put it as, the kingdom image is the future that we hold, yeah? Christian theology will speak about already, not yet. And we religious have an eschatological dimension before the world. We always uh, present before the world what the kingdom can be. So we are always living from the future. The kingdom, which is also called kingdom by one of the um, recent uh, theologians of religious life, you know, what we need is kingdom, uh, a world of kinship, fellowship, family. So view the conflict from the kingdom ideal, the ideal of the kingdom. That, that wider paradigm that we spoke about. View the other from the imago dei, the image of God that he or she is. See as God sees him or her. And let that image come into your present. So you're actually not responding to the person from whatever he did in the past. Maybe so many hurtful things, but you are responding to the person from the perspective of what he is capable of being in the eyes of God. So essentially, letting the future come into the present. Presenting yourself to the future that presents itself before you. The interesting thing is a theologian by name John Hogg is a, a evolutionary theologian. He bases himself 
on the evolution, uh, the theory of evolution by uh, Teyada Shravan, he his uh, book is titled "Resting on the Future," and this is a new paradigm that we religious need to embrace. We need to rest on the future and act from the future. I will only say that, and finally, learning from the models. We have so many models of conflict transformation in our midst. The scriptures give us a lot of models. Example, the case of Jacob and Esau. You know, I, I love Esau. In the Jacob Esau story, ultimately it is Esau who wins because he's the one who forgives. He's the one who takes a wider vision, not Jacob, who was a cheat. You know, but then God loves everybody. So that's why God takes care of both. So how did they transform the conflict? Read those chapters. Joseph's conflict transformation with his brothers. And Jesus has specific teachings on conflict transformation. And on the first day, uh, last week, we mentioned about the conflicts in the early Christian community about receiving Gentiles and about the matters of circumcision. How did they resolve them? Read these and identify what are the, what are the insights that we can gain from them. Just for example, the need for a timeout when we have a conflict. Jacob Esau used that technique, timeout. Self-reflection, Jesus speaks about it. Reframing the experience. Joseph reframed his experience of abuse by the brothers. He said, it is all within the plans of God for something better. God brought me here so that, you know, I would take care of you in the time of famine. He reframed his experience. Talk to your brother or sister in private. That's what Joseph does. When he talks and reconciles with his brothers, he talks to them in private. Dialogue, all the cases speak about dialogue. Offer and ask forgiveness. Jesus, Joseph, Esau are all examples. Consult elders and use mediation. Jesus will talk about it. Seek the imago dei, future potential in the other, what we already spoke about. Esau is the best case. You know, when Jacob meets Esau finally, you know what Jacob says? To see your face is to see the face of God. And he knows what he's talking because just on the previous night, Jacob had a wrestling with God. So he knows how the face of God looks like. And how does the face of God look like of a brother? Because Esau says, ah, oh, you know what? You didn't have to bring all these. I love you. You are here. That's enough for me. So those are the lessons we can learn. Then we have lots of traditional practice in our Christian uh, heritage, you know, culture of discernment, regular examination of conscience, sacrament of reconciliation, celebrating Eucharist meaningfully together as a community, spiritual direction or vocational growth sessions or counseling, reading spiritual and literary classics. I, uh, this is something formators need to take care of. You know, The reading habits are going down. Our reading is only as long as a WhatsApp message now. But we need to really read spiritual and literary classics, especially literary classics, I would say. You know, because they are all about human lives. Then the Emmaus walk in communities, what I already suggested last week. If we can do this, some of these practices that traditionally have come to us, you know, we can avoid a lot of conflicts or we can transform conflicts into, into moments of growth. And finally, your own congregation will have lots of aspirational practices suggested by your constitutions, your directory, your chapter documents, your documents on charism, spirituality, please yeah, go back to them. You have your own resources, means and you know, norms regarding how to deal with conflict. Now the appendix B in the article on conflict transformation that I shared with you last week, it has a community exercise to do. If you're interested, you can do it as a community. Finally, and I'm not going to explain this, you know, the, Human culture is founded on conflicts. In fact, there's a school of thought, mimetic theory that says that human culture is founded on victims, on a victimary mechanism, yeah? The sacrificial dynamics. The tomb is the first cultural symptom, cult first cultural uh, symbol, the tomb. And what is a tomb? It is the enemy who is murdered, the first conflict resolution by killing the enemy. And you know what the gospels or the Judeo-Christian revelation brings into this world? The empty tomb as the new foundations of a new earth and heavens. 
that there shall no more be victims in the society. So what the empty tomb does is a, is a correction of the cultural dynamics of resolving conflict by eliminating the enemy. Empty tomb is about embracing the enemy as my brother or sister. And consecrated life, you know, is actually a Eucharistic therapeutics to culture. I'm actually giving a course three to, uh, December 3 to 5 from the University of Mysticism Avila in person and of course online as well. Titled as Morphing Crowd in the Community, the Breast Function of the Eucharist. I will be sharing with you this, uh, this link. If somebody is interested, you can sign up for that. We'll discuss more about it from the perspective of cultural foundations on conflicts and how the Eucharist responds to it as a solution and how the consecrated life becomes a Eucharistic therapeutics to culture. A final word, I end with this, two scriptural passages, be you all of one mind, tender-hearted, brotherly, merciful, and of a humble spirit, not rendering evil for evil, or insult for insult, but rather blessing, because you are called for the purpose of inheriting a blessing. And let no evil word proceed out of your mouth, but only such as is good for edification, God is the need of the moment, that it may impart grace to those who hear. May this be our prayer. May this be my wish for all of you, all of us. Thank you.